My name is Jennifer Jones, and I have the privilege to serve as Vice President of the American Association of Kidney Patients and as an AKP Ambassador. As a United States Marine Corps veteran, I possess a deep understanding of the resilience required to overcome adversity. My personal journey with kidney disease began while I was deployed in Afghanistan in 2011. In what seemed like an instant, I transitioned from serving as a combat camera videographer to being medically retired in 2013, following a diagnosis of a rare autoimmune disease known as membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis type 1 idiopathic. Throughout my journey with kidney disease, I've experienced in-center hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and am a two-time kidney transplant recipient receiving my first gift of life from a living donor, and now my second from a deceased donor. As Vice President of AAKP, I am committed to advancing AAKP's principle of patient care choice, protection of the donor-patient relationship, and transcending status quo kidney care through timely research and innovations. AAKP has tremendous empathy for individuals struggling with kidney disease. This is why AAKP invests so much time and so many resources in creating educational events and materials to assist patients and families in their fight against this chronic condition. And this is also why we are so deeply committed to training patients to become highly effective advocates to impact the policy decisions that will impact their lives and the lives of millions of other patients. Our next session entitled, The Decade of the Kidney, Innovations in Transplantation, Emerging Therapeutics to Meet Patient Needs is of vital and strategic importance to AAKP. And to every patient living with a kidney transplant or interested in securing a future transplant. AAKP is fighting for better drugs and diagnostics that will help patients and transplant teams prolong transplant survival. We are joined in this noble effort by the American Society of Transplant Surgeons and the American Society of Transplantation, ASTS and AST. Status quo medicines in transplantation are based on clinical endpoints developed 20 to 40 years ago. Clinical endpoints designed to show one year survival of the organ graft. There are no clinical measures for long-term transplant outcomes or that take into account side effects of immunosuppressants. Right now, the FDA is weighing approval for a new co-primary endpoint that will foster the next generation of transplant drugs. AAKP thinks the FDA must approve that new co-primary endpoint. AAKP, ASTS, and AST are fully aligned on this issue and we made it part of our formal 2023 Shared Principles on Transplantation Statement. And right now, despite all the efforts that went into creating new diagnostics that determine if a kidney transplant is failing, CMS is sending confusing signals regarding who has ongoing access to these diagnostics and under what conditions. AAKP thinks that needs to change as well. Patients and their transplant teams need clear and timely access to diagnostics to make certain our transplanted kidneys are working as they should. We're kicking off today's session with an AAKP friend and ally, Dr. Karen Heenberger. Dr. Heenberger is founder, CEO, and chairperson of Lifebulb Inc., a groundbreaking patient engagement platform. She is also a two-time kidney transplant and pancreas transplant recipient. To say that she's an accomplished woman through the challenges she's had to endure is an understatement. Furthermore, she has played a pivotal role in taking two biotech companies public on the prestigious NASDAQ exchange. Her expertise is highly sought after as both a clinician and as a patient. Dr. Heenberger recently joined us during AAKP's sixth annual policy summit. And she is back again as a strong ally in our fight to advance the next generation of transplant drugs through a new FDA-approved co-primary clinical endpoint. Dr. Heenberger joins us today to share her story with kidney disease and the need for advancing transplant medications. It is with great pleasure and admiration that I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Heenberger. 
please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to the AAKP for inviting me to speak here today. I'm going to talk about the decade of the kidney and innovations in transplantation, focusing on the need for next generation transplant drugs and diagnostics. Uh, my name is Karin Heenberger, and I'm truly looking forward to uh, uh, sharing with you both my story and my perspectives. So really to put it all into perspective, I wear many hats within the transplant community, but the probably the most important one is perspective of a patient. I uh, was diagnosed with type one diabetes as a teenager and uh, was very driven to pursue medicine and science really because of that diagnosis. I wanted to find cures. I wanted to find solutions for myself and, and of course for others. And uh, it, it drove me to go very quickly through academia and uh, pursue my degrees. But uh, what I never did during those years with type one diabetes and in science was to share my own story as a person living with type 1 diabetes. And I think that together, of course, with the relentless disease that type 1 diabetes is, um, I, I went through many of the complications that unfortunately hit so many with, uh, with diabetes. And I ended up 20 years after diagnosis with um, a kidney failure, with diabetic retinopathy, and uh, really uh, being quite sick. And one day in New York City, um, I found myself waking up um, uh, from the kitchen floor after having uh, fallen um, because of passing out, hitting the dishwasher corner, and you can see that middle slide uh, not looking uh, perfectly. Uh, so uh, that was uh, really the beginning of my going back into health because I was struggling with very brittle diabetes. And at that point, um, pretty, pretty bad kidney uh, disease. So I went through a kidney transplant now 14 years ago and a pancreas transplant 13 years ago and am now insulin independent. And then about five months ago, I needed a second kidney. And I, I believe that's kind of part of this presentation. But the first kidney and the pancreas allowed me to have my own child. And that of course was an incredible gift and something that keeps me going and, and keeps me motivated more than anything else. And her name is Liv, which means life in my language, Swedish. And um, uh, the final picture there on the right side is, uh, is a picture of the two of us. Uh, it puts a smile on my face. This drove me uh, very, very hard to um, uh, pursue my mission in life. I had, as I mentioned, studied to become a scientist and a medical doctor, but then pursued a career within um, the industry of healthcare and always very focused on innovation. But after being told that I needed a kidney transplant and not knowing anyone with a transplant, my number one goal was to try to find that peer. And I think what AAKP does and what many organizations in this country are pursuing is, again, that community and, and really bringing patients together so that we together can have a shared voice. But what I did not find at the time of my kidney transplant was a digital community outside of Facebook that could bring together patients. So therefore, I have uh, been pursuing this and have now together with the team at Lifebulb created Transplant Life, which is a digital community where patients can share experiences, feel supported, and also get educated and together have this strong voice so that we can request and even demand uh, better treatments. So I was one of those people uh, with severe or end-stage uh, renal disease that needed um, renal replacement ther therapy, which in my first uh, kidney transplant never um, rendered me um, in need for dialysis because it was a so-called preemptive living donor uh, transplant. But in my second transplant now, about five months ago, I was on dialysis. And that was a very, very tough experience. Uh, it was something that I had never even imagined that I would be on. And as I was experiencing these dialysis sessions, it really dawned upon me how important it is with education and better awareness for how to pursue transplant. And that leads me to our two most important priorities. 
we truly want to support the living donor uh, campaigns that so many together with us and, and the AAKP and other organizations are pursuing because there's so many people who currently are dying on the waiting list and even more individuals, as we could see in the previous slide, who are dying uh, in the dialysis chairs or uh, not even on the list because they're not getting to that point because of lack of education or uh, just, just not awareness for the process. So the supply is not matching the demand. And uh, I think we need to do much more to educate and to bring patients uh, the strength so that they realize that they can deserve, they deserve more, and therefore they should pursue living donors. Number two, which is really important, and this is the reason, by the way, for my second transplant. So when I got my first kidney from my father 14 years ago, uh, that kidney could have lasted for life it had, if it had not been for the very drugs that were supposed to protect it. So the drugs that are currently available in the United States were approved many, many years ago, and they do cause serious consequences that we'll talk about next. But that led my first kidney to become scarred and in need of additional replacement. So first dialysis, and then I was lucky enough to have a second living donor and my sister who was that donor, I'm immensely grateful to. So our ask, you know, together with the entire kidney community and in many cases led by the wonderful organization AAKP is to truly affect policy so that living donors are protected. It's not right that if you give up an organ to save someone's life that you should be vulnerable when it comes to insurance and when it comes to any kind of coverage, for example, uh, life insurance that affected my father uh, 14 years ago where he had more difficulties getting his life insurance because he now had only one kidney. So uh, we also need to pursue education and, and bring potential donors the stories that are truly you know, remarkable and how they can pursue this, en this enormous gift and still uh, feel very good and, and go on and live a full life and a, and a, and a long life. And number two, uh, it truly is a regulatory issue at this point where the FDA has still maintained endpoints that are essentially focused on the very first year of graft survival and patient survival. You know, two criteria that all the drugs that are in the market right now do very well, over 95% patient survival and over 95% graft survival. But we need more metrics that reflect the long-term survival of the graft as well as patient reported um, outcomes. And this is something that our European colleagues have already got to, and we believe the FDA should not be behind. The US is a company that should lead in life sciences. So uh, look at these patient stories and look at the uh, fantastic organizations that pursue even altruistic donations. And I, a picture there to the right is a picture of my sister and myself and uh, the picture to the left, another sister pair uh, led by the wonderful Sharon, who is leading the organization Kindness, Kindness for Kidneys. And it's just two stories of so many out there, but it is possible. And I, I just want to bring that to so many out there who may be listening, that it is possible to get a living donor because you deserve better. And I think that's the number one you know, message to all of you out there with uh, kidney failure is that this does not need to be the end. So uh, this is just a reflection of what uh, patients suffer from. And we've done additional survey work and, and truly interviewed patients as well as physicians. And sometimes there's a disconnect between what physicians feel is important, meaning the graft, meaning the kidney. But if you're a patient who after your kidney transplant uh, suffer from hair loss, suffer from nausea, suffer from enormous diarrhea, makes it difficult to even go out socially, or um, brain fog that makes it difficult to compute, maybe even keep the job that you uh, currently have. And then of course the tremors and the headaches. 
you know, those are immediate side effects that can happen due to the drugs that we're on currently. Uh, and then are the more long-term ones that, of course, are are similar with all immune suppressive uh, medication. And we're moving toward more immune modulatory medication where there is less effect on infection and less effect on cancers. But it's truly important for patients to realize that these are the current side effects or consequences of the drugs that we're on. So we can take preventative action, meaning screening and so on. But um, these are the comments coming directly from Transplant Life, where we see patients who are complaining, not complaining, they're talking about their issues. And I think this is what the FDA and others need to hear more of, because it's not easy to live with a transplant. In some cases, patients say, as we said here, being a transplant patient is just a different route of having kidney disease. And that to me is a, is a truly, a, it's not a success because if we had better drugs and newer drugs, like we see in other disease areas, for example, oncology, we would have better quality of life after getting this gift of life. So uh, with that, I, I truly want to thank you for the opportunity to share not only my story, but so many other people's stories through Transplant Life. And I really want to be part of the change. We want to be part of the change because it's not just important to us, but it's important to so many out there who are living with kidney disease and living with a transplant. So thank you to the AAKP. Thank you, Dr. Heenberger, for your powerful remarks. Now, let us introduce our next speaker, who is also a highly valued and loyal friend of AAKT, Dr. Ulf Meyer Kriesch. Dr. Meyer Kriesch holds the position of Chief Scientific Officer at Veloxis Pharmaceuticals. With a wealth of experience in the field of transplantation, he is a board certified nephrologist, boasting over 20 years of practical clinical expertise. His contributions to the scientific community are evident through his impressive portfolio of over 170 published works, which have been featured in numerous esteemed peer reviewed journals. He also represents Phylloxis on the Transplant Therapeutic Consortium. TTC is a multi-stakeholder coalition that aims to accelerate the medical product development process for transplantation. Dr. Meyer Kreish joins us today to speak to Phylloxis's commitment to the transplant community. Dr. Meyer Kreish, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to you and AAKP for the invitation to the 48th annual meeting of the association. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, we are at a very uh, important juncture here in transplantation where uh, the patient alliance is really important to advance our field to, in order to serve our patients better. As you can see here in the title of my presentation, I'm referencing the dramatic unmet need uh, for new therapies in this space as our maintenance immunosuppression is really old at this point. It has been invented many years ago. Nevertheless, there's some hope. There are some new investments in this field, and we really need to make sure that we drive these investments forward. Uh, and the coalition between uh, public and private partner sectors is really important in driving this forward. And I'm going to talk about this as a little bit in my talk. So I'm starting with this summary because I really would like uh, to get your attention while I still have it and get to the significant points. So again, transplantation is an area with a dramatic unmet need. Yes, short-term survival out to year is very good, but long-term survival is clearly not where it should be. Uh, the goal should be uh, in kidney transplantation, one kidney for life. And obviously also the survival should be with adequate quality of life. To improve these types of parameters, uh, we need to focus on uh, endpoints which go beyond one year. And we need to get endpoints which can predict long-term outcomes 
and which can measure how patients feel and function. Once we start to focus on these types of endpoints, then we can start improving those metrics. A new endpoint in transplantation would also reinvigorate transplant drug development in order to bring innovation to the space. As I said, there is a fledgling pipeline in transplantation, but uh, regulatory pathways enabling these therapies to come forward is really, really important. And most importantly, uh, there is a real gap in understanding between what patients are experiencing and what regulators are considering and only actual transplant patients and patients who are waiting for a transplant can really help us to narrow this gap and educate the regulators on the unmet need we have in this space because the ultimate risk benefit assessment of any drug is based on how urgent advancements are considered in this field and in listening to everybody in this field, everybody feels it is urgent we get new therapies. So now looking at this a little bit more in detail, the unmet need, very clearly long-term survival of kidneys and also other organs is not where it's supposed to be. There have been dramatic progress made in short-term survival. And that's because that's what we have focused on, that's what we have been measuring on, and that's where the regulatory hurdle is. But the issue is really to improve long-term survival. A disease donor kidney on average lasts currently 10 years. And certainly when a young patient is getting a transplant, that means uh, three, four or more kidneys may be needed throughout, throughout the lifetime. And that is uh, clearly not ideal. In terms of the number of transplants, we are doing reasonably well. On the left side of the slide, you can see year after year, the number of kidney transplants is increasing. Currently in the US, about 25,000 kidneys are transplanted every year. But that is then contrasted by 80,000 patients who are on the waiting list. And you can see also over the years, this waiting list has really not changed a lot. And what that means is there are dramatically long waiting times and most of the patients who are getting on the waiting list will never get an organ. The short uh, kidney transplant survival contributes to this waiting list because many patients who are losing a transplant are getting back on the waiting list. Uh, so in order to help with the waiting list, we really need to extend the life of the organs. The current standard in uh, immunosuppression and maintenance immunosuppression for kidney transplants and also for other organs is fairly well defined. In most of the cases, uh, mycophenolate morphetal is combined with tacrolimus and uh, in some state cases steroids. And that really has been the maintenance immunosuppressive regimen for the last 20 years. And it is working reasonably well in the short term, albeit with a lot of tolerability issues. So yes, it keeps the organ alive, but the patients have a very significant burden of illness due to the nature of the medications they are taking. On the other hand, we do have a fledgling pipeline in transplantation for maintenance immunosuppression. And there are several compounds you can see here who are in either in phase one or phase two. Now for the lengthy development plans we have, that means most of these agents, if they are successful, they will probably become available for patients and in clinical practice in uh, 10 years or longer from now. Nevertheless, it's important to recognize there is a pipeline and we have to safeguard that and help uh, to pave the way forward uh, for these compounds. 
The regulatory pathway in transplantation is challenging because it measures one-year outcomes based on a composite endpoint of death, graft loss, acute rejection, or loss to follow-up. All of these events are valued equally. So whether a patient dies or has an acute rejection is um, uh, counted as the same. And then suddenly uh, the one-year outcomes are reasonably good. So it is very difficult to differentiate therapies based on this endpoint. And suddenly this endpoint is not looking at long-term survival and it is also not looking at quality of life, i.e. how patients are feeling and functioning. So new endpoints in transplantation are really needed in order to allow for drugs with better safety profiles and with better tolerability profiles to come forward. One of the significant efforts which has been ongoing for more than five years now is a public-private partnership which is called the Transplant Consortium, which has tried to bring a new endpoint forward uh, by qualifying uh, the IBOX as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. This is a consortium which is comprised of the founding members, which are the transplant societies, ASTS and AST but also the European Transplant Society is part of this. The FDA has actually representation on this consortium, the NIH, and then um, many of the transplant uh, companies who are driving this space forward. This consortium under the leadership of uh, CPATH has built the largest integrated kidney transplant repository with more than 23,000 kidney transplants in this database. And it has also standardized data from 13,000 kidney transplant recipients in order to qualify this reasonably surrogate endpoint, which had been already derived from the Paris transplant group. So this has been originally uh, validated uh, by the investigators and now has been independently verified by this large transplant database as something that really works. Based on the data, which are really very convincing, uh, EMA has really fast tracked that. And within a very short time, the IBOX was qualified in Europe, allowing the IBOX to be used in the conditional approval pathway, which does two things that in Europe now, when drugs are being developed in this space and the difference is being found with this endpoint, the sponsor can claim superiority, so saying that it's a better therapy and a single trial might suffice for approval. So this is a major incentive for drug companies to actually develop drugs in this space. Now, on the US side, the FDA is still looking at this data. We submitted the qualification plan, uh, but certainly uh, the process is a lot slower and at this point, it is not quite clear where this is going in the US. But again, in Europe, there was a dramatic um, regulatory achievement through the qualification of the IBOX in this setting. Certainly in general nephrology, and many in the audience here certainly will know about this, uh, a very similar effort has gone forward and the FDA has in fact qualified proteinuria as a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint for IgA nephropathy. And with that, already two drugs have been approved based on the uh, on the surrogate endpoint. 
and there's a long and prolific pipeline. There are a lot of companies who are investing in this space where previously there was no investment at all. So the qualification by the FDA of a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint was really godsend for patients because now there are all these new therapies which are being developed in IgA nephropathy. So in conclusion, uh, the community has clearly come together over the last five years to seize the opportunity to bring a badly needed change to the transplant space. We did prioritize bringing forward a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint for kidney transplantation, because as we have seen in the renal space, that can really reinvigorate the pipeline. The voice of the patient is incredibly important to us. AAKP is incredibly important to us in this public-private partnership because only the patients ultimately can testify on how important it is to bring new drugs to this field and how antiquated these current regimens are and how badly we need new therapies in this space. So thank you so much for your attention and thank you so much for AAKP for helping so dramatically in driving forward those initiatives in order to bring new therapies to our space. Thank you, Dr. Meyer Kreish. The research you are involved in is truly inspiring. Next, I am delighted to introduce Dr. John Friedman, Chief Medical Officer of Eurofins Transplant Genomics. Eurofins Transplant Genomics is a pioneering company dedicated to enhancing organ transplant outcomes globally through its transplant rejection diagnostic solutions. Dr. Friedman is a great friend of AAKP, and he brings over three decades of experience in delivering groundbreaking healthcare solutions to a diverse range of stakeholders, including patients struggling with complex medical conditions, healthcare providers, and payers. The AAKP leadership respects Dr. Friedman as a highly creative and strategic thinker in the field of true patient-centered medicine. We consider him a tireless leader in the fight for innovation and patient access to diagnostics that improve and save lives. Without further ado, I now hand over the reins of this presentation to Dr. Friedman. Thank you, Jennifer. I want to thank the AAKP for inviting me to speak at the National Patient Meeting. Hopefully, some or most of you heard my talk at the recent Global Summit where I spoke on the potential impact to kidney transplant patients by the recent Medicare and MoldyX billing articles. I am here today to give an update on how you, the patients, have made your voices heard, and I have exciting updates on the MoldyX billing article. So I present to you the patient impact, innovations happening in transplantation. I'm John Friedman, the Chief Medical Officer of Transplant Genomics. I've been here for about 18 months, and I have no conflicts of interest to report. As you will see, things have been very fluid in the world of coverage for post-transplant molecular biomarkers. What I will share today are the latest and most up-to-date facts and how you, the patients, have really made a significant impact and all in the right direction. So a little background from the Global Summit. Who is MoldyX? MoldyX was developed in 2011 to oversee coverage and reimbursement for molecular diagnostics, hence the name MoldyX. The LCD, Local Coverage Determination, over transplant biomarkers was released in June of 2021. A MoldyX billing article was issued in early March of this year with a rather quick implementation date of March 31st. This left the industry in turmoil. This was later revised in April to be effective at the end of June, but not before many of the biomarker companies were forced to downsize due to expected impacts on revenue. There is little doubt that the billing articles were aimed directly at cost containment. And to call this simply 
a clarification I find kind of funny. It was pretty much a wholesale change. But think about it. If you use donor-derived cell-free DNA to monitor a stable population in a surveillance mode, monthly or even weekly, at $2,800 per test, it was simply unsustainable. Let's take a look at some of the language from the billing article. For a given patient encounter, only one molecular test for assessing allograft rejection status may be billed at a time. And if a biopsy is performed, the test and the biopsy cannot be performed simultaneously or within a short window of time. We feel that this has the consequence of squashing innovation and does not allow a subspecialist physician to use his or her best clinical judgment in how to care for patients, infringing upon the government practice of medicine. Here's some additional language. A center may only utilize this test if they would otherwise be using a surveillance protocol biopsy. The consequence of this would be limiting access to large urban transplant centers that utilize these protocol biopsies. Only 20% of transplant centers actually do protocol biopsies. This is, was in direct contradiction to the HRSA push for equity and inclusion in transplantation and would limit the access to rural and community nephrologists discriminating against those rural and underserved and minority populations. Whereas other biomarkers companies want a full repeal of the billing article, TGI focused on this access issue and rallied our advocacy partners like AAKP, as well as professional organizations like AST and ASTS, to write MoldyX and explain the impact of this access restriction. And to add further confusion and not clarity, MoldyX added Z codes, also known as billing codes, to all the molecular biomarkers, whether the intended use was for surveillance or for cause. And they didn't just do this for transplant genomics, but for all the molecular biomarkers company. We have heard, however, directly from MoldyX that the billing codes listed on their DEX exchange page are irrelevant and that the approved intended use is the key for reimbursement. Through all the turmoil and fog, one thing remained crystal clear. The approved intended usage of each biomarker as outlined in the original 2021 LCD. And it is important to also remember what the populations these tests were validated on. Gene expression profiles were validated in a stable population showing no sign of rejection, whereas donor-derived cell-free DNA was validated in an actively rejecting population. So what is the key takeaway from the billing articles? The gene expression is the only test approved for the intended use of surveillance. All donor-derived cell-free DNA products are essentially the same, and their intended use remains for cause. And that is no matter how you spend the language on a test request form. Surveillance is surveillance and for cause is for cause. Hot off the presses, in the middle of August, MoldyX came up with some very important changes. MoldyX added a public comment period. This public comment period was universally requested by all patients and provider advocacy groups. The voice of the patients and providers was loud and clear. Interestingly, MoldyX originally pushed back on the public comment period as it is not required by federal law. It is only required for national coverage determinations known as NCDs. This public comment period is currently active and open through September 23rd. But it didn't just stop there after adding a public comment period MoldyX continued by reiterating there would be no change to the coverage of the intended usage, but other significant language changes are noted here. Most importantly, the removal of the access restriction that transplant genomics strongly advocated for and you, the patient, asked for. Also very important, they note the frequency of testing clarification quote, no more often than the frequency of the OPTN center-specific surveillance biopsy schedule. 
No kidney transplant center biopsies monthly or more often. At most, they would be quarterly or every three months. And further emphasis is also made on the test being used for the population in which the test was analytically validated and has demonstrated clinical validity. Again, a stable population for surveillance or an actively rejecting population or cause. So please, take advantage of this public comment period before it ends and keep getting your voices heard. So what's next? Beyond the public comment period, many of you have likely seen that Moldex recently approved heart care, a combined gene expression and cell-free DNA test for post-heart transplant monitoring. We find that confusing as it directly contradicts the billing article language restricting the use of two tests together. This language is taken verbatim from the updated billing article summary of evidence page. While these technologies are newer, there have been large and multi-center studies that support the use in both renal and heart transplantation as minimally and non-invasive methods to assess allograft status and to modify immunosuppression regimens and also to avoid unnecessary biopsies. Evidence continues to develop for other transplant allograft organs, as well as developing new tests. Additionally, there is evidence that while some cell-free DNA and gene expression profile tests may have different intended usages, combining both may further improve graft rejection determination in certain circumstances. So perhaps here, two, is greater than the sum of one plus one, and it's time to advocate for the return of dual biomarkers in kidney transplantation. Who gets hurt? It's always the patient. Many transplant programs have stopped using all biomarkers due to the confusion. They've gone back to the dark ages. I quote from the OPTN 2022 kidney report that says, there has been no significant innovation in the last 20 years to support kidney allograft survival. And some programs have continued to use biomarkers the way they always have, despite the billing article clarification on intended usages. This could and should lead to patients getting balance billed because that's the law. But when the fog clears, and hopefully this webinar will help, these innovative biomarkers do make sense and hopefully will lead to a lower loss of glomerular filtration rate and save donor graphs, bringing value, improved quality of life, improved quality of care, and overall lower costs. In conclusion, you the patients have made your voices heard. AAKP is a powerful and aligned voice of the patient. You have impacted a positive change to the billing articles but there is still more to do. PGI values our relationship with AAKP, and we look forward to working together in the future to continue to improve the care of post-transplant patients. Doing things right the first time always improves patients' care and always drives a better bottom line. Thank you again, AAKP, for inviting me to present this topic. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for an insightful presentation and your company's commitment to supporting patients in their post-transplant care. Finally, I am honored to introduce Dr. Paul Grimm, a pediatric nephrologist based in California. Dr. Grimm directs the Stanford Pediatric Nephrology Fellowship Program, where he spearheads groundbreaking research in the field. His research focuses on exploring avenues for achieving tolerance, addressing the unique challenges faced by infants and highly sensitized recipients, as well as delving into the complexities of multi-organ transplants, cystinosis, and patients encountering uncommon transplant-related issues. We are truly privileged to have Dr. Grimm with us to talk about emerging innovations to help young people living with kidney disease. Dr. Grimm, welcome to the program. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, AAKP, for allowing us to present our work from Stanford. So I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Elice Britannia, who is a stem cell uh, head at Stanford, and I'm the medical director for the Pediatric Kidney Transplant Program. So 
when you talk about combining a stem cell transplant with a kidney transplant, the response, dude, have you lost your mind, is pretty, pretty common. But I hope to spend the next few minutes explaining why this could actually be useful. As we all know, unfortunately, transplanted kidneys don't last a lifetime. And this is so important for young people who get an organ transplant. The average kidney from a deceased donor lasts 11 and a half years. The average kidney from a living donor lasts 19 years. So for people to live to a ripe old age, they need more than one transplant if they can get that. Well, why is that? As we all know, drugs have toxicity that limits how much can be given. Many of you have experienced prednisone, for example. But the other immunosuppressive drugs had their own problems. We have problems with viruses such as Epstein-Barr virus or CMV or BK. Many patients who get an organ transplant develop new onset post-transplant diabetes. And we have the problem of adherence. Whether you choose not to take meds or can't take meds or can't pay for meds, if you don't take the medications, rejection isn't too far away. One of the things that has become very important to me is long-term outcomes. And this is data from Ontario, Canada, where in the uh, socialized medical system, they can follow people for many years. If a child has had a solid organ transplant and they still are alive with that organ 20 years later, the chance that they have a life-threatening cancer, like a solid tumor or PTLD, adds up to more than 20%. And other studies have suggested that you're, if you're alive 30 years after your organ transplant, you have a five chance of having had a severe cancer. And this adds up because of the toxicity of the drugs over the years. The problem is that the immunosuppressive drugs that are necessary to prevent rejection also reduce the body's defenses against cancer and infection because the immunological processes that cause rejection are the very same ones that protect you from infection and cancer. So there's a yang and a yin. If you increase the immunosuppression, you can protect against more rejection. That puts you at risk for infection and vice versa. So there's no perfect solution. So as a transplant physician, I was doing the best I could. We were getting people transplanted and getting them off dialysis, which was a good thing. But these people walked into our lives and caused us to reassess what we were doing. These children have a disease called Schimke immunoosseous dysplasia. This is just genetic defect that these children had. And it causes them to have a poor ability to fight infection, a poor ability to grow. They develop kidney failure in childhood. And the problem is when you do a kidney transplant, they develop cancer or infections, or craft versus host disease, or they reject. And so they have very poor outcomes. People have tried stem cell transplants for this disease, and four out of five of them died very quickly. So when kidney transplant has poor outcomes and stem cell transplant has poor outcomes, it seems crazy that we would decide to do both of them at the same time, but that's exactly what we did. So when you do a stem cell transplant, the goal is to develop something called a chimera. Now in Greek mythology, the chimera was an animal that was made up of, of pieces of other animals. So in this image, the head of the lion, there's a goat, there's a dragon. So chimerism means you have a small number of cells called hematopoietic stem cells from the donor living in your body. Now you only have about 10,000 of these cells in your body and they don't divide very often. But when they do divide, they start a cascade that produces all of the blood cells and many uh, 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 of the immune cells and the infection fighting cells that circulate through your whole body. Now, there are many different centers that are doing research to try to understand how we can use chimerism for kidney transplantation. For example, there was a study called the ONE study, which involved eight centers in Europe and North America. And they did a lot of work to understand the mechanisms that are needed. Nobody ever got tolerant, but they uh, did a tremendous amount of basic research. Now, at Northwestern, uh, under the direction of Dr. Susan Ilstad, they had developed a tolerance induction protocol for people who were not HLA identical by infusing stem cells, which, uh, which had been treated in the lab to develop facilitating cells. 
And this involved treating them with drugs and radiation to make space in their bone marrow for these cells. And then they would do the living donor kidney transplant on day zero, and then they would give them the cells afterwards. They uh, had some good preliminary results and they moved their intellectual property to a company called Talaris that was trying to commercialize this. Unfortunately, they had a lot of uh, problems. A lot of people had complications and the whole thing is ground to a halt. At Johns Hopkins, they also have been doing combined bone marrow and kidney transplant uh, in certain patients who have multiple myeloma for many years. And they have a protocol which is making tremendous progress. So at Johns Hopkins, they've been using uh, a combination of bone marrow transplant and kidney transplant for people with uh, multiple myeloma, which is a, a cancer that uh, affects the immune system and the kidneys. And they've gotten some really good results from this and are making great progress. And they also use drugs to make space in the immune system, some radiation, then they do the procedure, and then they use immunosuppression afterwards and slowly taper the immunosuppression. My colleagues in the adult Stanford side, so just, just in the next building over, have been working for more than 20 years to develop tolerance. And they have a mixed chimerism approach where uh, they have been uh, uh, using uh, stem cells from the donor and a transplanted kidney. And so what they do is they do the kidney transplant and they do a number of doses of radiation and thymoglobulin to make space. They also use regular immunosuppression, prednisone and a calcium inhibitor. And then after the kidney transplant, they give the stem cells back and they slowly taper the immunosuppression. This has worked very reliably if you have an HLA matched kidney, like a kidney from a brother or a sister. For an individual patient, one out of every four of your siblings, hopefully, has a chance to be a, a, a HLA matched donor. So if you have your brother Frank here, there's a 25% chance that Frank is HLA matched to you. Um, and so in these donor situations, this has been very reliable. Unfortunately, this has not worked for people who are less matched. So for a sibling who's a half match or for a parent donor, for haploidentical transplants, the tolerance has been metastable. It happens for a while, but sooner or later, most people will get their tolerance broken and they can reject. And this can be triggered by your immune system being activated by something else like an intercurrent infection, or vaccination. So the adult Stanford adult tolerance protocol hasn't been yet reliable for anything less than a perfect match. So at Stanford, on the pediatric side, we needed to take a different approach. For children, they almost never have a haploidentical brother or sister who's old enough to be able to be a donor. So we have to rely on parents, uncles, aunts, cousins, who are the most common donors. And so we couldn't use mixed chimerism, which is what all the other programs have been trying to do. We had to use a different kind. Now there are two forms of stem cell chimerism. There's mixed chimerism, where the stem cells of the donor and the recipient coexist. There's low risk of graft versus host disease or infection. So you gently make space and you make a pocket for the new cells to come in, but you don't get rid of all the old ones. To deal with donors who are not 100% matched, we had to take a different strategy. In a take no prisoners, wipe them all out approach, we have to completely destroy the stem cells, the bone marrow, the immune system of the recipient and completely replace them with 100% donor cells. This is a much higher risk of graft versus host disease and infection. But we need to do this to be able to get tolerance in something that's not a perfect match. So this is an example of a, of a parent coming in to have their stem cells harvested. So it's just done through a peripheral IV. And when we harvest them, we get the cells that are circulating after we have given medications to get those stem cells circulating. Well, graft versus host disease is the real problem with stem cell transplant, with bone marrow transplant. Graft versus host disease is a limiting factor, and that's what we're afraid of. It's not caused by the stem cells. Graft versus host disease is caused by the other cells in the infusion. So why don't we just transplant the other stem cells?
It turns out there are all sorts of different kinds of cells that we collect when we are uh, harvesting. The hematopoietic stem cells are just one tiny fraction of those cells. So it turns out that lonely stem cells transplanted alone don't do well. They need a village to survive. They need some of those other cells. They don't grow well, they get rejected, and the patient gets infections. So we had to take a different approach. So let's just transplant the good cells. Well, which are they? Alpha, beta, T cells. They are important for your immune system, but they cause graft versus host disease. The B cells carry Epstein-Barr virus. They can trigger post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease or cancer. So we don't want them either. But NK cells and gamma delta T cells both protect against infection, support the new stem cells, and are helpful. So we want those. So that's what we transplant with the hematopoietic stem cells. So when people come in for this protocol, we provide an engineered stem cell transplant. The donor comes in in the morning. The cells are, are pulled from their peripheral vein. They go to the lab. The bad cells get depleted and the good cells get infused into the child in the afternoon. They're fresh, never frozen, kind of like Wendy's. The stem cell transplant program had transplanted over 100 children with this engineered stem cell infusion. These were kids who didn't have kidney failure, but they had immunodeficiency or bone marrow failure or something like that. And they found with this protocol, they had a very low rate of complications, graft-versus-host disease, or bad things happening. So we were very confident this was a good approach for these children. So the protocol that's used is a reduced intensity conditioning where we use medications like cyanocyclobulin, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and a little tiny bit of total body radiation to make room for these cells and to destroy the immune system of the recipient so that the new cells come in and can recapitulate their own immune system. And so we did this with three children with Shimkus. They successfully had the stem cell transplant and between five months and nine months after the stem cell transplant, they got their kidney transplant. And we published this in the New England Journal of Medicine last year as really a breakthrough. So far, the outcome is that these children are between three years and more than four years after their kidney transplant. Their kidney function is 100%. They're on no immunosuppressive drugs whatsoever. They've had no transplant-related complications. They're 100% chimeric, and their immune system has recovered. So they're totally tolerant of their donor kidney but they have normal responses to infection, cancer, things like that. So this is a picture of some of the recipients and this is used with permission. So this was a milestone. This is the first time that a pediatric hematopoietic stem cell transplant was performed with the express purpose of immunosuppressing for an organ transplant. The risks seem to be outweighed by the benefits, but long-term follow-up is needed. So looking to the future, the question is, is this safe? Could this be used for other things like genetic diseases or diseases which recur in a transplanted kidney like FSGS or IgA nephropathy or systemic lupus? What about normal children and teenagers who have a high non-adherence risk? If we could get this right, if we could get it figured out, could this be something that could be used in resource limited areas of the world where they just can't afford immunosuppression or organ transplantation? What about other organs like living donor liver? What about deceased donors? So those are the questions we started asking. Our next patient was a patient who had focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Now FSGS is a pattern of injury for many causes. Some are secondary, such as medication associated or an imbalance of a small kidney with a large person. Some causes are genetic. This can be familial, or it can be people, especially of African heritage, who carry the APOL1 high-risk variant. But some FSGS is systemic or primary or autoimmune, and this comes back commonly in transplanted kidneys. So we had a patient who came to us. He had FSGS, which came back in that first transplant. His first transplant was at age nine from his mom, and it was lost in three months in spite of the standard immunosuppression from FSGS. He'd been with dialysis for a decade. And as a young adult, he was soon thinking of stopping dialysis if we couldn't offer him something that could get him out of dialysis. So we felt that it, the risk and benefit ratios were ethically acceptable. 
so we offered him our program transplant. After his stem cell transplant, to our surprise, he developed severe graft-versus-host disease. We were able to treat it successfully, but he spent months in hospital. He required intensive nutrition and rehabilitation. But almost a year to the day after his stem cell transplant, he did get that living donor kidney from his dad. His post-transplant course was blissfully uneventful. He has no signs of acute or chronic graft-versus-host disease. And at last follow-up, about 18 months after his kidney transplant, he had normal kidney function. He was a college student on the tennis team. This graphic shows he has normal urine protein. So in a year and a half, on no immunosuppressive medicines, he's had no recurrence, no rejection, and he's living immunosuppression-free with, with a no evidence of recurrence. We looked at cystinosis, which is a multi-system lysosomal storage disease. And this picture shows crystals of cysteine deposited in kidney, in bone marrow, in liver, and in the brain. Patients with cystinosis have kidney failure as an early manifestation, and they used to all die by the time they were 10. Now that we can do dialysis and transplant, as they get older, it turns out that they develop other problems, including severe muscle weakness which is often the cause of their death because they can't cough, swallow, and eat and drink. Stem cell transplants are being offered to cystinosis patients for other reasons. And we had a patient who needed a kidney transplant and had a living donor. So we offered this protocol to that patient and their family. That patient developed severe graft versus host disease and had a very bad outcome. So it made us have to reassess this project and understand what was going on. When you look at it back, we had a history of 100 patients with cancer or bone marrow failure who received a transplant with minimal graft versus host disease with this protocol. Our first three patients with Shimkis had little or no graft versus host disease. But when we started using it for patients with, with kidney failure who had otherwise normal immune systems, they developed graft versus host disease. So a first patient like that might be a fluke or maybe secondary to autoimmunity of FSGS or second transplant status, but two in a row? Clearly, we had to reassess this. We had to understand what was making the kidney failure patients different than those hundred other patients who did so well. And the answer is we believe that kidney failure or uremia is a state of chronic inflammation. The Basic science data shows all aspects of the immune system are affected in people who are on dialysis. The innate immune system, which is your white cells like neutrophils, monocytes, dendritic cells, and your adaptive immune system, which is like your T cells, your cytokines, and your regulatory cells. It appears that this heightened inflammation in a person with kidney failure pushes the balance toward or triggers increased risk of graft versus host disease. So we've adjusted this protocol to customize for patients who are on dialysis or close to dialysis. Prior to hematopoietic stem cell, we give a low dose of steroids. During the conditioning, we are now doing continuous immune monitoring with multi-parameter flow cytometry. And after the transplant, we're using a low dose of tacrolimus for about six months, intensive immune monitoring, and earliest therapy initiation prior to clinically apparent graft versus host disease. Our sixth patient, as a Shimkis. Next slide. During his conditioning, we found immune activation. Next slide. This is a, a multi-parameter flow plot, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but the dots uh, and the spirals in the upper right-hand corner should not be there. That indicates the immune system inappropriately being activated. It turned out that we could use a personalized medicine approach to target exactly those slides that were inflamed. We used a drug called basiliximab, and it caused those activated cells to disappear. So this patient was discharged doing well, then switched from hemodialysis back to peritoneal dialysis, developed some gastric inflammation, which responded to a, a little bit of a proton pump blocker and a little bit of steroids. He returned home, had some grumbling intestinal complaints. So we immediately were very careful and assessed him. His biopsy was suggestive of graft versus host disease, but that was enough for us to adjust his therapy and he's responded nicely. We are targeting a living donor kidney transplant in just a few weeks' time. 
and it looks like with this new protocol, things seem to be on the right track. The current paradigm for end-stage kidney disease treatment is once you're a kidney patient, you're always a kidney patient because you have CKD, dialysis, transplant, you lose your transplant, you're back on dialysis, hopefully get a transplant again. We believe that with research and maybe with this protocol, we have the potential to stop this cycle and really stamp out this paradigm and maybe be curative, but it takes research. Research which changes things. When I show this picture to the medical students, most of them don't know what this is. These are children and teenagers and young adults in iron lungs during the last polio epidemic. They participated in the research that brought vaccination and cured the world of polio. And so now these only are in museums. We hope that with research someday we can do the same with dialysis machines. Where are we are now, we have a clinical trial funded by the California Stem Cell Initiative, and we are offering this therapy to people with Shimkes, people with FSGS who have lost at least one kidney transplant from FSGS, people with severe lupus, and we will be offering it to cystinosis patients in the future. Every three to four months, we plan to do a stem cell transplant and learn from the previous uh, experiences as we get better and better. It may take years for the immune system to completely turn back to normal after hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And so it'll take years of follow-up to know if these patients truly have been benefited and what complications or long-term experiences they have. But that's the job of research. But without research, we don't make progress. And one day we hope that the prescient words of uh, Dr. Bones McCoy will come to pass. In one of the Star Trek movies, he says, dialysis, my God, what is this, the dark ages? Hopefully dialysis machines will be relegated to a museum sooner or later. I want to thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation and help you understand this exciting protocol that we're involved with. If you are interested in more, on more information, more knowledge, or want to participate, contact us. We're very interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Grimm, for enlightening us on the latest advancements poised to revolutionize the lives of young individuals living with kidney disease. I'd like to again thank all our session speakers for sharing their time and expertise with us. 